This time on Jonathan Bird's Blue World, Jonathan tries helmet diving. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird, and welcome to my world. Scuba divers swim through the water with perfect neutral buoyancy, able to hover in place like a fish. Scuba stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. The self-contained part is important. Since scuba divers carry their own air supply and breathe through a small portable regulator, they're free to go wherever they want. But long before scuba was invented, people still dove. Underwater breathing apparatus has been around since the 1820s when the Dean brothers in England figured out how to pump air down into an airtight helmet and suit. Soon the underwater world became accessible to people. The umbilical to the surface limited mobility but deep-sea divers, as they were often called, could now perform all kinds of tasks underwater, from construction to sponge collection. The surface-supplied air meant an unlimited air supply. Make his first dive. In the 1940s, a training film for the U.S. Army diving program was produced. Helmet diving hadn't changed much in 50 years, but the four-window U.S. Navy Mark V helmet had emerged as the world's best. It was used by the military from 1916 all the way up to 1984. Getting underwater and staying there is itself a test of diving skill. Despite his 40-pound shoes, 84-pound belt, 54-pound breastplate and hat, as a diver calls his helmet, he may float like a cork if he fails to control the flow of air into his suit. Helmet diving with more advanced modern helmets is still used today for construction, oil rigs, salvage, and other work which might require a diver to be underwater for hours at a time. I want to try it, so cameraman Rick and I head to New Jersey where the Garden State Underwater Recovery Unit practices helmet diving and sometimes still uses the Mark V helmet for rescue operations. I meet up with Vincent Scarponi and his team at their base, and we head out to the Round Valley Reservoir in Clinton, New Jersey, where I will dive. Helmet diving requires a lot of surface support, so the team has brought three boats. We're diving off of a pontoon boat, specially configured as a platform for helmet diving. In just a few minutes, we reach the dive site, and now I have to learn how to don all this gear. Wayne Gerhardt's is going to help walk me through it. Sit right here. Okay, the first thing you're going to do is put the suit on. We just take the bib out okay. and then slide it up a little bit. Now stop. Shoes you want on tight because they're flat bottoms okay. and you they do suck into the mud a little bit. Okay. So you don't want to pick your foot up and have your shoe remain on the bottom. That would be bad. It doesn't have to be a lot. I can see it's getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> but that's nothing. Now the weight belt. This one's only 45. Only 45 pounds, he says. What do you want me to do? Just now put your hand hands over top, man. Okay. Just hold it like. All right, here we go. I'm almost feeling like I'm getting used to this. Hold your head still. Okay. Vincent turns on the flow of air, which makes a lot of noise, but at least I can breathe. 
As they seal me in, I realize that there's no way I can get out of this gear without help, or even open the front window for air. My life is in the hands of the dive tenders. This is more claustrophobic than cave diving. Fortunately, there's an intercom system so we can talk to each other. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, oh, sweet. I want you to, I want you to give you two taps. I want you to stand up, walk to the ladder, turn around, and go down the ladder backwards. Okay. Ready, Rick? We're getting up. Oh, man. Turning around. As I turn around to climb down the ladder, I can't see anything, so I'm doing it by feel, and I have to trust what the tenders tell me to do. Okay. Oh, it's a good thing they're small steps. As I go one step at a time into the water, the tremendous weight of the gear starts to become offset by buoyancy. Feels so good to get down into weightlessness. All right, where's that descent line? Right here. So grab the descending line with your right hand, wrap your legs around it, and just proceed slow. Wrap my legs around it. Yeah, you want to lock on to it. All right. This is cool. The ladder doesn't go to the bottom, so I basically slide down a rope like I'm going down a fire pole. Going down the descent line. Clearing the ears. Going down. Going down. I have hit bottom. But the water here is not bad. A GoPro inside my helmet gives a little bit of an idea what it looks like from inside. You really can't see much. Wow. You don't have much view out of this thing. You got the side windows, the front window. And yeah, usually there's not much to see when you're uh, doing construction <laughs> work. <laughs> So I could see my left hand out the left window and my right hand out the right window. This is pretty cool. Between the typical lake visibility and such tiny windows, I have no idea where I am or which way I'm going. Cameraman Peter Venutsos is giving me directions. This way? That way. Okay. Wants me to go this way. Unlike scuba, which only delivers air when you inhale, there's a constant flow of air through my helmet, although the bubbles that come out the back increase when I exhale. Man, it's hard work climbing through silk that's up to your knees. Yes, it is. Yeah, try staying in the clear water. Ryan. Okay, now stop for a second and see if you can feel the end of the yellow pneumo line. I'm gonna send air down. You're gonna send air down the yellow pneumo line. The pneumo line is an open hose that can serve as a backup air supply, but its main purpose is to feed the pressure at depth back to a gauge above so the tenders know how deep the diver is. I have bubbles. Now the bubble stops. Okay, it's 15 feet. 15, nice. Don't forget, that's 15 where the pneumo line is. It could be another three, four feet from there to your feet. The weirdest thing about this experience is actually, to me, how much it hurts your feet. Because when you're walking in the muck, there's a lot of muscle power required in your feet to keep yourself from tipping over as the muck swooshes around behind you. Oh, that's cool. 
so I now have my little selfie stick, which is way cool. And it's recording, which is cool. Huh? <laughs> selfie stick! I don't know how many deep sea divers in the 1800s had a selfie stick! <laughs> Oh, I gotta make a major muck action here. And I can get a shot of Peter. <laughs> Say hi, Peter! <laughs> All right. Eventually, it's time for me and my selfie stick to head back up to the boat. Even though I'm wearing over 100 pounds of gear, I'm buoyant enough in the water that I can pull myself right up the rope with one hand. Climbing up the ladder is another story. With every step, more of my gear goes above water. Each step is harder than the next. Getting the helmet and weight off is a relief. Woo! Baby. Well, I've done my first dive with the Mark V helmet, and I'm here to tell you that as fun as it was, it's a lot more work than scuba diving. So I might just stick to scuba diving, but wow, underwater in 500 pounds of gear. <laughs> Somebody give me a torch. I feel like I should build something. So while helmet diving is not the best way to explore the underwater world, it is an important part of the history of underwater exploration and remains to this day one of the most effective ways to work for extended periods of time in the blue world. And thanks to the incredible effort of these generous members of the Garden State Underwater Recovery Unit, I got to experience diving in a real Mark V helmet and experience for myself the rich history of diving.